Hi, everyone. Welcome to another book discussion between the Ann Arbor District Library and the Unerased Book Club. Tonight, we are discussing uh, the novel We Ride Upon Sticks by Quan Berry. And before we get started, let's just quickly introduce ourselves and um, give a brief visual description if you're comfortable doing so. So I will start. I'm Lucy. I work at the library as a library tech in the youth department, but I also do a lot of adult programming like these book discussions, which I love doing. Uh, I am a 51-year-old woman with glasses and shoulder-length brown hair, wearing a purple sweater in front of a white-ish wall with some books behind me. I'm Emily. Uh, I am a librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library. I do books for kids, but I do mostly events for grown-ups like these. I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I have long, reddish, brown, wavy hair. I'm wearing a blue t-shirt with a black hoodie and sitting in front of a mostly blank wall. Hello, my name is Amanda. I also am a library technician in the youth department at the library. I am a middle-aged white woman. I am in front of a white wall, plants around me. I'm wearing a, a striped sweater, glasses, and I have dark brown hair that's around shoulders length. And I'm happy to be here to discuss this fun book today. I'm Anne. I am a book processor at the Ann Arbor District Library. I primarily work at the Westgate branch. Uh, I am a mid-40s heavy set white woman with uh, light brown shoulder length hair. Um, I'm wearing a shirt that has red and black and gray paint smears across it basically in front of a blurred white background. My name is Lily. I'm a um, public library associate at AADL. I'm a white woman in her mid-20s. I'm wearing a blue sweater. I have brown hair, and I also have a blurred background, and I'm really excited for my first book discussion. Cool. Hi, I'm Fatima. I am a co-facilitator for the Unerased Book Club. I am a South Asian woman in her mid-30s. Um, my hair is black and pulled back into a ponytail, and I'm wearing um, a I guess beige sweatshirt and, and a red top. Um, and my background is a digital background of the skyline in Chittagong, Bangladesh. Um, I'm very glad to be here with you all today. I'll pop in. I'm Beth. I am a library technician in the outreach, on the outreach team um, at the AADL. And I am in my early 60s with, and I have uh, dark hair dangly earrings, white sweater with an animal print underneath that white sweater, and um, a window in my background with some other stuff on shelves. And I am excited to talk about this book. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Sheila. We'll see how well this introduction goes. Um, I am the founder of Honor East Book Club and one of the co-facilitators. Um, I'm a sure. South, yeah, South Asian American woman in my early 30s with shoulder length black hair and glasses. I'm wearing a yellow hoodie and I have a, my not a, my toddler with me who uh, was not happy to see me leave our playtime to come do this. So she joined me. Uh, so she'll be participating as well. Um, she really loves reading. So this is right up her alley. And I'm really, really excited to talk about this book, um, Red Upon Sticks by Quan Berry. For listeners at home, quick synopsis. This is a contemporary uh, fiction, like uh, magical realist book about a team of field hockey players in uh, Massachusetts near Salem, indeed, um, who form a pact to uh, a magical pact that will hopefully carry them all the way to state champions championships. So uh, I will turn it over to anyone yeah, that is an owl, to talk about what they thought of the book. I loved this book so much. Um, I love this book group because it has me expand what I read, but this is the like the kind of book that I always want to read. Um, and so it was such a joy to read for this. I think that like it was a huge there were so many characters and yet I still felt like we got to know them as individuals. 
Uh, it was funny, but there were still some stakes. The magic was a whole lot of like, is it happening? Is it not happening? Which is one of my favorite little wrinkles of like, well, I don't know, could just be normal or or their pact could have worked. I just found it a delightful read from beginning to end. Uh, and I was sorry to see it done just because I wanted to keep living in its world. I also love, oh, oh go ahead, Amanda. You go ahead. Ahead. I was going to say, I also really love the book. I actually read it um, three years ago after it won the Alex Award. Um, when I read the premise, I love the Alex Awards. It's um, adult books written with a particular appeal to teens, and that's my genre. And I read the premise, and I was, I thought, yep, this is my first Alex Award I'm going to read. And I read it then and loved it. I read the book, and this time I listened to the audiobook. Um, almost exactly three years later, loved it again. It was really fun on audio. Just a fun book all around. So many characters, so many weird bits. I loved all of the 80s references. I loved a little bit of magical realism with like the witchcraft popping in. I loved their bond as these teen girls playing a sport together. It was just wacky and fun and wild. And I thought it was really unique. And I loved the shared voice as the whole team being the narrator for the book. So I just loved it. And I was glad to see it pop up for this discussion. Yeah, I also, this is also a rereading for me. I um, actually this is my third time reading this book. I listened well, I listened to it once. I've read it twice. Um, I I love this book. I graduated from high school in 1990. I played field hockey. I grew up in Massachusetts, so it's like there's so much in this book that like cultural references. You know, even like places where they're driving, the place they go to pizza, the places they describe in um, you know, in Saugus, Massachusetts and stuff. It's like, yep, seen it, know it. So that part of it, it's always really fun to read, but I also just love the, and also like the particular theme of the witches, especially at Salem, just because that's something that like was around a lot in my childhood. And I love that, but I love, love, love the idea of maybe the fact that like witchcraft is empowering and it's not this evil and it's not this um thing where you have to be hung and and persecuted so that was uh one of the parts of the book one of the many of the parts of books the book that i love i i started to listen to it um because and then i mean i did listen to it but now i'm i'm just catching up and rereading some parts but i, I it was hysterical and i mean i loved the characters i i just there were just so many funny parts to it and and uh and gritty and like we really did get to know the characters um and I, it was it was cool and the 80s references because I mean I was I was had little kids at the time so but all the you know the the Sally Jesse Raphael glasses and um things that were referenced on TV the uh the claw uh all that so funny <clears throat> I really enjoyed the book as well. Um, I did personally find it a little bit too much 80s nostalgia. Um, you know, I was I was catching all of it and enjoying it to begin with, and then it just felt like it was a little bit uh, self-indulgent. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I loved the characters. And Beth, like you were saying, you really did get to know them. But what I liked is you also got to know the amount about their families that you would if you were one of them like you would hear about stuff going on at home or family drama but just kind of from the very outside I don't know I liked it yeah I think a lot of the um 80s references went over my head because I was not alive but that made it yeah, easy to cruise through them they did not feel like too much for me um but I loved it a lot. Um, and I really also liked the we narrator. I The first time I read a book with that was um, Juliet Suka's The Swimmers a couple years ago. And I loved it there too. And I think it's one of those things where you would think it would make it difficult to understand, but it it's really seamless in this book. And um, I think it added to the witchiness of it, not really knowing who's talking and is it one of the girls or is it all of the girls or is it Emilio? You know, <laughs> um, I liked that about it. Um, and I also liked that I felt like each of the girls 
um, was first introduced in a way that was a little bit more limiting or stereotypical of who they were going to be. And even as I started to get further in the book and realized that a lot of it was about them kind of breaking out of those shells, I was surprised up until the last page about who everybody turned out to be, you know. I also just uh, really love this book. This is not my bread and butter reading, although this is my bread and butter genre of television. Like I love, I love teenage related <laughs> TV shows and things. And so when I was reading this, I was like, this would make for such a good TV show because you've got a really great cast of characters. Um, everybody gets like their own little inside view chapter or several chapters and there's so many like dynamic relationships. I think what struck me most about the book were like so many mother daughter relationships and the teammate relationships, as well as like some of the romance in there. Um, and I just really, really enjoyed all of it. Um, and I think the we perspective landed itself very well to that, where, you know, at some point it, it it's kind of hard to figure out like, is it we from the like, is someone an individual speaking, but still speaking in the we, but it some oftentimes felt like they were all kind of narrating it for us. And it was, um, was great. And kind of launching off of that, like, I wonder what you thought about um, how the we point of view might fit, um, fit into like the larger themes in the book about team or unity. Um, and like, how does that help with this story because I think some a story like this could be told in a lot of different ways I definitely see like a relationship to a coven you know um it's like this team and this or this group of of witches I think that um like Lily like you were saying that we get to know them a little bit stereotypically and then they break out of their shell I think the team and the strength of the team and the shared belief kind of gives them the ability to actually kind of do their own thing and become themselves. There's also this, um, I think it was at the end of, of boy Corey's chapter where he had kind of branched out with his own thoughts for a while because he lost his band and then he put it back on because it was too much for him. And there was this thing about like 11, um, something about it's like scary to be out there on your own. It's much better to be in a bundle of 11 is how they put it. Uh, so it was just, but I, I couldn't help thinking about a team being like a coven. And then especially with the shared thoughts and the shared narrator. I think it lent itself really well to this story. It wasn't jarring for me. It wasn't something I had to get used to. It just, after a while, when you're reading about this unit, this group of girls, it just made sense, especially when it gets more into the, like the shared hive mind and wearing the blue bands and becoming one it just made more, it made sense for how intense the girls were, were together in their thoughts, in their actions, in their, their sports play. It just, it, it made sense. I couldn't picture like one person narrating the story, or even if it was somebody else who was telling the story, it just would have taken away stuff from it just, because these are the points of view of like the teenage girls. So who would it be a teenage? I, it just made sense. I, and I'm sure the author could have done it some other way. Maybe it would have been easier for them. I think, I can't imagine trying to do this as an author to have 11 different voices with one collective person sharing their thoughts and their story but it just it worked perfect for me for this book it was really really well done I think that's a sign that we're in the hands of such a good writer because I think second person can get really gnarly even if you aren't with 11 characters <laughs> And it was just done so deftly. So, you know, you hear the premise of the book and you might think it's more of a fluff read, uh, but it's clearly, it's very well written. It's very thoughtful. I loved like the moment that Julie told her teammates that actually she wanted to go by her full name, Julie Min. And then for the rest of the book, she was Julie Min. It was just like the instant switch. I think it like helped me as the reader feel like I was part of the we and part of the team, even though obviously I'm still just a spectator as a reader. I just, there were so many little moments like that where I was like, this book is funny, but it's also really well done. It's got the the bones as well as the, you know, the makeup. 
I also think for me, being part of that we helps me to um, like maintain empathy for a lot of the characters when they are really awful to one another. Because I think there are different times when each of these girls kind of does become like an evil witch. She does some really messed up things. But being in the we, it just makes me always feel like I'm on her side a little bit because it could be her talking, you know. Um, and I think that that thematically works with the novel. Um that you just come to understand them even when they are acting out a little bit. I also think it would almost be more difficult to try and have all of these characters in a 350 page book um, and do it well without the we, because if each of the chapters, instead of being a we from kind of one person's point of view a little bit more, and it was just a solid, this is the boy Corey chapter, this is the, it would make it really difficult to explore everybody's experience. Yeah, it was, it was really well done um, to, I just, I loved hearing about the, the backgrounds of the, of their families. Like, I think one of you had already mentioned, um, uh, and just and how things turned out too. Uh, that's always I love that. And when it, it seems rare when you get books like that, but um, um, it was a good choice. I, I do you know much about Quan Berry? I was. I know that Quan Berry is in her fifties. Um, so she, you know, this is the age that she grew up in. Um, from the acknowledgments, she also. Like, I think she played sports and knew about um, or like had a coach who was very closely resembles what's in the book. Um, and she's a poet and an essayist and as well as a fiction writer. So just a powerhouse. And she's a playwright, too. So mm. um, when I was reading this, I was like, oh, this reads kind of like a TV show, like the way that my mind could see it. Uh, it was very much like that. And then I, I saw that she was a playwright um, and I was like, oh, that that actually like the ensemble. I think ensembles are so challenging to write for any writer. Um, and I think that that's a craft that comes with writing, script writing and television writing particularly. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like that's probably I don't know. I mean, she she's got so many talents, but that's probably where it's coming from. Yeah, I was totally picturing yeah. it as a show too. I mean, yeah. I'll do that a lot anyway, I guess. But but this was just, yeah, yeah all of the eighties aspect of it was funny. <clears throat> I read um, both of her other novels, and it's kind of amazing because they are both really well written. I mean, beautifully written. She's so talented. They're so vastly different from this and from each other that it's amazing. One of them takes place in Vietnam and it's sort of about this um, woman, girl who who dies, at, you think, and sort of this ghost who helps his family travel throughout Vietnam. And then the her most recent novel takes place in Mongolia. And it's these people who are searching for like the next, kind of like Dalai Lama, essentially. And it's amazing and the detail and the research for those books that she did and like I learned so much but it was really interesting to read all three of them and think I can't believe that the same woman wrote these three books and then that she writes poetry and plays and so she's just got so much um so much to say it's kind of exciting I also love that she's an author in her 50s writing these like delightful things and you I mean I, I think it brings me a lot of joy um, because I think the perspective that she has really comes through in this book I loved anytime like she would reference something that was the norm in the 80s but she would kind of just call it out very gently you know whether it's like race and um, you know transracial adoptees and because there are characters who are Asian American but they were adopted by white parents and just a, she would she would call it out, but in a really gentle way, a humorous way, or it, it never felt condescending in any way. Like, oh, here's the politically correct way to think about this. But it was very much like, this is just kind of how we did things. But, or like, you know, this assault happened, sexual assault happened, and we were all kind of angry and we were upset, but we also didn't, you know, um, do anything or like she didn't, we didn't name it that. Um, and just acknowledging it really 
up front. I, I really appreciated that because I think that before we had the language to describe these things, we lived with it. And some of us can feel very guilty about um about not knowing or not, you know, not doing something or not calling it out or whatever the case may be. Um, and she handled it with a lot of grace. Yeah, I appreciated that when listening to it, she would, you know, pop in and say, well, would we want this for our daughters, daughters now? No, but this is the way it was. And I mean, I know because I was there and yeah, um, just one of the, there's something that just cracked me up because nobody says Manischewitz um, as a, like a, 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 whatever you call those, a, a, Thing to say a, 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 sh a shout out um i i happen to say it it's from an old commercial which is a, it's an old wine it's a kosher wine kosher company and sammy davis jr was on, had um commercials and he'd go man oh man is Shevitz. and so this one of the girls said that i think it was heather and that i just i thought that was hilarious and you probably didn't even catch it because like it was so it's a weird word and you wouldn't know what it means. And it was random, but um, I caught it and I thought it was hilarious. I think there were a lot of things like that that were, oh, sorry, that were straight out of like, I remember TV commercials or songs or, and like sometimes very subtle, you know, um, but she just really, yeah, they were sort of sprinkled throughout there. It was fun to try and catch them. We also liked how the we, even though it was telling the story of the past and seemed like they were in the past, they still had insight as to how the world was now. Um, like there was one comment they mentioned where they mentioned Samsung. Oh, that some Japanese company is going to be out of business by the end of the year. But as a reader, and it just had little things like that too, where it it felt smarter because it is kind of smart me to think about some of the terrible things that like happened in the eighties that just went un you know uncorrected. Um, but that was part of I think with the having the ending be the way it was where you got to see the full evolution of some of these characters and how they grew out of whatever, um, not grew out of, but sort of grew into the persons that they were becoming as young, as young teenagers who were going through this collective experience or being on this team together. I really disliked how that the narrator kind of had the, had a, had better, had better judgment than some of the things that were happening, even though it seemed to be present day. Very interesting to me. It was, um, we, we talked about this. We had an in-person uh, meetup a few, uh, yesterday. And so we talked about it then. So, um, I, it's really still sticking with me how nostalgia can only really be done for the seventies, eighties, and nineties, because those are the only, um, generations where people had access to their culture, pop culture in real time. And it has been around, um, uh, it's now on the internet, so you can relive it and it's like, feel that rush of how I felt when it first came out. But um, anybody born after 2000 does not get that because their pop culture is the internet and their internet is omnipresent and you don't have a chance for it to go away and to be ephemeral. Um, and so it's it's really bizarre. It's actually really bizarre to think about how nostalgia doesn't, it will not exist moving forward unless like the internet completely implodes. Um, and then on top of that, this is, one of the last generations that didn't have to think about social media as they're growing up. And so the coven aspect or being able to like do weird things with their friends, like you can't do that anymore because you're always worried someone's going to record it or someone's going to post it online without your consent. And um, it's not even about the permanence because there's so much that floods the internet. Nothing is permanent. I mean, it is, yet it isn't. You have to sift through everything to get to it. Um, but that you can't just have an experience to have it. It's a performance for somebody else, um, whether you know that person or not. And reading this and like just sitting with the fact that like my kid will never have that. It was just like a very jarring. It's not a negative. I mean, it's not negative. It just is. It's a very jarring experience to realize that kids can be kids and now they can't. Yeah, like... uh yeah, meeting out in the woods and, and dancing naked, all that stuff. I mean, I, I didn't even think about that part of it. That I mean, I, I was, as I read that, I was thinking, did I ever do that? No, but um, but maybe, you know, we definitely 
had experiences that uh, would have been a real bad idea to have on camera. Um, so it's just, yeah, I didn't think about that, that they, they just won't be able to unless, unless have those experience, unless everyone makes a pact to put their phones away. But even that, I mean, you can't even trust that anymore. So it's a good point. just going to say sort of on this concept of, of looking back and nostalgia and I like what Amanda was saying about um, the narrator sort of being in the past but also seeming to have some knowledge from the future. I really felt like that also um, came to a head with Mel's narrative um, and her being the one who was with the coach um, and I felt like I just really appreciated how Quan wrote it in a way that felt very humanizing, where she was like simultaneously as an adult saying this could have gone really wrong, but also really being in the mindset of being that 18 year old girl who's like, I'm newly an adult and I actually do know what I want. And it turned out right. And I think that that's rare that we have that perspective at both times that really like legitimates um, a, a teenager's agency at the same time that it's saying, mm, but you're also really young. And there's risk, you know. I thought that that was um, a way that the the multiple perspectives worked. Yeah, so I would agree. That was a very revealing, and and yeah, I really liked how that was handled uh, because uh, it because it when I first heard like she married the coach, you know, and then or whatever. Uh, but then you know, recognizing the age difference wasn't that big, you know. He was he was not an he was 24 years old, so yeah. Thanks, Lily. I will admit that part made me feel real achy. Um, and even though it did turn out fine, and yes, the difference between you know a, a six year age difference doesn't matter when you're that age. It it still skeeved me out a lot. Um, and that was like my one bit that it did seem like it it wasn't in. It would have been out of place in the book to spend a lot of time processing that. Uh, you know, I think part of having so many protagonists is even like your girls who you might say they were some of the main ones. We still didn't get that much time with. Uh, but it it made me feel uncomfortable when I learned that that was more than just a rumor. Well, I'll tell you what, I... <laughs> I, I mean, it was nostalgic for me just because there was, there was a situation like that when I went to high school, there was a, a girl and a, and a coach and I mean, a teacher and, uh, and they did, you know, they left town together and I don't, they're not together now, but, but I mean, they, I just, it made me think about that time, that situation and what was it like for her as a 17, 18 year old, you know, peer of mine, uh, having a relationship with was the teacher and it, it happens a lot, but it, anyway, it just, it didn't, it just made me think back on the rumors and, and the actual actuality of things that I, I learned about from people, you know, but I can understand it. It is skeevy. I think so, it, it uh, brings up a, I was just a good like question of things can make you, feel really uncomfortable, but they can also really be the reality for those people, you know, and, and it, it did feel weird. I think it always feels weird to hear about like a student and a coach, even if he wasn't her coach and they weren't that the age difference wasn't that big, but that's also something to like sit in that discomfort a little bit and just be like, you know, this feels weird, but it also for these people turned out okay and, it, and like you were saying Sheila like this never that that situation well for so many reasons wouldn't happen today but the access that people have to information and the internet and social media and stuff like that would have I feel like that would have turned out so differently for both of them um yeah I think there's something I I was also like a little yeah, ick I, f I felt the ick with that um just like the flashing you know flashing the coach and all of that I, I felt the ick but at the same time I was like really appreciative of like how sh how teenagers were written 
and like the audaciousness and the irreverence sometimes. Um, and I, it, you know, I pulled out my, after reading this, uh, uh, um, and I'm, I pulled out my journals from when I was in high school and I read them for the first time since then. And I, I was like really, really shocked, like with my own perspective on things and some of the things that I would describe like doing, um, uh, like I remember it, but the way I remember it is so different now. It's almost like I've rewritten the memories to, to be more polished, to be more presentable, but the actuality was so different. Right. So whether it's like, um, feeling jealous of some of your friends or, um, you know, just like the little dramas that you would get into. And I and I feel like she captured that well and didn't try to make these characters perfect in any way or just like even even idealized in any way. Um, and that the magic that they felt came from these little acts of rebellion, but they were somehow like more authentically themselves as a result of it. Um, and I thought and I found that to be just fascinating because it's almost like a challenge to, like I was like well what if we like did more of that like would that make us feel more powerful in some way and like would that give credence to this idea of like this magic would somehow manifest um so it gave me it gave me so much to think about in that way I really loved that Emilio and writing these things in this book gave them that confidence to do some of the some of the rebellious things are getting in trouble but also just the confidence just like to be so much bolder not in only the sport they're playing with just in teenage girls walking through the hallways or being in the locker room or connecting with other students or Nikki the Chin or other characters in the book. I like that device. And it made me think I did want, I'm like, hey, that that little like impetus, that little excuse, that little, little like scoosh, like, hey, go do the thing. I just love that it was a, a notebook that was Emilio. Just magical. Like I, I want I want a little notebook to, to make that come. I want that to be in real life. <laughs> This is one I will recommend for sure to a number of folks and we'll share it with um, with readers when I get the opportunity to to just like decide what people read because one of my jobs sort of allows me to do that. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, within reason. But anyway, this is one that I would uh, add to lists for people. Yeah. I was recommending it to a friend who also likes these quirky kind of reads like I do. And uh, she said, I, but I don't know that I could read that many field hockey game descriptions. I think she'd looked at the table of contents because every section is written as if it is a game. And I said, oh, you'll get a tiny bite of it at the beginning and a tiny bite of it at the end, almost none at all. Um, so I, I liked the structure of the field hockey for it. I did appreciate not uh, reading too many uh, game descriptions I think the only thing that really got me is having to make that leap of disbelief that a school would have their prom in November um but and, and, and one of the yeah. things I was like oh just let it be homecoming it'd be fine if it was homecoming but once you get over that leap I feel like it was just it was such a treat so you just have to accept things but the fact that the thing I had to accept was not that magic was happening uh or maybe not but that it was that a school would do prom in November yeah, is that a thing, Lucy? In Massachusetts? Um, I don't know. I mean, it might have been a thing at the time, oh. like for her. I mean, I don't, I don't, I didn't even go to a prom, but um, I do know, like, she went, she grew up in Danvers and she went to yeah. Danvers High School and she was on the field hockey team. And like, so I think a lot of this was direct experience, but I don't know, you know. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, I mean, I think there was yeah. a big thing. You know, you either have to pretend that field hockey season is the entire school year long, or you need to, you know, right. change what some big events are. Uh, it was mostly just joking about it, but it, yeah, no, yeah. <clears throat> So I don't typically read like sports themes themed books. I'm curious if it, other people do how this novel compares, especially um, 
in regards to like well one the description and two just like teams in general sports teams or women's sports teams particularly it's not a genre i seek out typically but um and i was a little unsure about if i'd like it but um but i i did yeah I've definitely read some sports related like graphic novels for um like middle grade level for variety of sports and I I I like hockey and soccer as sports. I understand those the best. So when I find one that has that and that that appeals to me, I don't seek it out or anything. So I read this um a few years ago and then last year I read there was a play called The Wolves by Sarah Delap that was written in like 2015 or 2016. And it is um a teenage girls soccer team and it's written as a play. And the whole play is the conversation of these girls before a game. It's just them doing their warm-ups. It's the same warm-up routine, but it's just them talking, the whole play of conversations. And having read that book after this one, I loved reading another book or another a play where it was these female athletes who were together as a team and kind of behind the scenes. And it was really, really, really well written. And it was just a random find on the shelf. And it turns out it was like um, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. I had no idea. I just found it on the shelf and read it. And it was great, but it was really neat to read after this. So I do recommend The Wolves by Sarah Delap. And Lily, you were shaking your head. Have you read it? I just went to see it. Uh, Wayne State put it on in November. And so I, I saw it and then immediately read this book after. And um, I don't read sports books. So when you first asked, nothing came to mind. But I was thinking about the play the whole time I read this. I think the tone is very similar um, and very much about like women's empowerment and also friends being sort of horrible to each other <laughs> yeah and they're not about it's not the play-by-play -play of the sport they're playing they give you enough insight but it's more about the characters and their thoughts and feelings in their lives in this and in the wolves that's so cool you saw the play i'm jealous <laughs> Thank you for those. So then just uh, going off of what you said, Lily, about uh, the just friends being kind of terrible to each other, that a lot of that happens in this book. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on uh, friendship and, uh, you know, how like, you know, how close they seem to be, but they're still like doing some rather mean things to each other. It, it, I, I felt like when they revealed a little more about what was going on in their households, uh, like especially Jen, you know, for example, um, just and and just the different uh, backgrounds, it, it sort of it just you could understand the behavior didn't excuse it, but you could understand why someone would behave in a way that was I what I thought. <clears throat> to me, it felt so authentic like I just remember girls in high school um like friends even just being horrible you know and then and then being friends again it's just like the, I feel like that was part of the drama and the experience of high school and um part of what like makes me never want to experience high school again you know it's just like uh but I I it just felt really um really real yeah, and kids that age, um, you know, you are recognizing that your actions have consequences, but it's not something you think of as much. You know, I think of the time that a friend made me cry in high school because we went to something together and then she pitched me for other girls. And as an adult looking back at this, I know it wasn't something that was done on purpose to be mean, but it still had me crying the rest of the weekend. And it's just like, that's the way you are when you're a teenager. Everything, you don't think about your actions and everything also just feels like the biggest, most meaningful thing that with hindsight, you can go, oh, it, it's okay. It all was fine. That's so true. You're just, your feelings are so intense. Like I, I, I think back of some boys that I had a crush on, crushes on, and like in the, where how would I just decide but the intensity like like deep deep I really really love this guy who I've never had a conversation with um and you know it's um, heart palpitations when you see him it's just like it it's you're just it's the hormones and stuff but man it's rough it's hard to live like that 
one of the things that's kind of interesting because of the kind of shared mind and the we is that you didn't get the very common talking behind your friend's back aspect of treating each other badly, which I didn't think about at the time, but you can't talk about people behind their back when they can hear your thoughts. It's one of the things that like really works for me about it being a sports novel is the concept that they are sort of friends, but they're a team and there are like friendships within it. But the thing that's holding them together is not really friendship. And so I feel like it's an interesting exercise in them, like learning to support one another, these people who are really, really different from them. And some of them that they like don't even like, but they still develop this bond that helps them like empower one another um, and do things as, as a group. Um, Cause I definitely did not do team sports. So I feel like that was not something that I experienced as much. Most of the relationships in my life are like, you know, sought out because of shared values and shared interests. But I think it's always really interesting when you put people together where that's not the case and they still have to figure out a way to, to work together. I know this book is, um, it's an adult novel, but again, it has high appeal to like young adults and teens. And the one thing that I do think is really cool about like teen fiction is having sports as a backdrop is a way to, it's a thing where you will have a variety of characters from different backgrounds and ideals coming together in one space. And it's like an easy like little device to put them in the same like room. But with sports, you have a big challenge of trying to achieve a common goal of like getting to the big game. So for this, having them, I just thought it was really well done. I think it, it works really good in this book, even though it's like, I can't think of other adult. I guess there are some like adult novels where like they're about sports or like a fiction. I can't, it, it seems for me, it just seems like this book was written for kids, like, you know, for teens. Um, so I just, I do think that sports is a nice, like you were mentioning, Lily, it's a great way to get different people in a room that normally wouldn't be in that room and have them try to figure something out. You know, it's like the, being on a jury or something. Yeah. Or in a hotel where there's a murderer. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I just, I did uh, to read a quick article before we started. Um, it was a, a review, but um, in it, though, they mentioned, they use the term bubbler, okay, which is, I and listening to the book, it's, you don't catch it as much as, um, to me, as seeing it in writing, but the bubbler is the drinking fountain, but I guess that's just a Massachusetts thing. It's called yeah, that I, I could, Oh, in oh, Wisconsin, yeah. too? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's really the babla, you know. Babla. <laughs> <That's> babla. <laughs> question I had, I don't know that much specifically about the Salem witch trials. I don't know if any of you have read more, but I would love to hear if you noticed. I know like Abby's name, you know, is important, the Putnam, but if you noticed other like specific references like that. Most I mean, of I only notice what comes from the oh, crucible, yeah. so that <laughs> is pretty much talked about a lot in the book. I mean, I, and I knew when they pointed it out, like Rebecca Nurse is very familiar to me, um, and you know the places that they go. But they were they were she was telling us about that. So, like Rebecca Nurse's house or the tree, you know. Um, I do think it's interesting, and I like that it's in this book that like Salem was m so much bigger and that Salem witch trials and like if you go to Salem Massachusetts it's very touristy and very witchy and there's like a witch museum but none of that actually happened there you know <laughs> which is kind of interesting um so I, I, it, it was I think it's good for people to read a book that takes place in Danvers and realize that that was actually Salem Speaking about just the Salem witch trials, but also the timing in which this book was written uh, or time period, I am curious as to the library shelving it in historical fiction, because to me, like the 80s technically are in history, but 
it didn't feel like historical fiction to me. That's interesting. I didn't realize that was where it was shelved. But I also remember I was born in the late 80s. And uh, when I, a friend came to me and said, guess what? Kids books that come out with deal when we were kids are now historical. And I think about it because like when I was a kid, things in the 70s felt like they were historical fiction. And that was a while ago. It's a it's a weird thing, but I think it's important that books like this aren't historical fiction because I also went many years into my adult life thinking I didn't like historical fiction when really I just didn't like reading books about wars. Um, and it wasn't until I realized that, wait a minute, this this book I really liked and this book I really liked and this book I really liked. If you go to the bookstore, they're all shelved there. Uh, that made me open my mind and say, oh, well, actually, it's just war stories I don't really like. I, I like historical fiction. And I think, you know, it takes fun books like this that that aren't about something that feels very stuffy uh, to open folks, some folks up, like past Emily, uh, to recognizing that the genre has quite a bit. Yeah, I... I... I think it's a, like a little jarring though to realize that this is historical fiction. Maybe that's just because I graduated from high school in 1990. So um, it does take me a beat when I read things that took place in like the 80s um, that, you know, that they are historical, but that was 30 years ago. Like, well, 1990 was over 30 years ago. So, you know, um, it it is like that's historical. And like you're saying, Emily, history is more than what we are typically taught, you know. It also includes parts of your life, which is really interesting. Thought thought provoking. Listen, just listening to you all talk about what is or does what does or doesn't constitute historical fiction. Um, so I was born in in the nineties, uh, and like just my my mom was in residency in the eighties. My dad wasn't in the country in the eighties, or like for most of the eighties, and so for growing up, I didn't have any 80s cultural touch points. Like that wasn't part of our home culture. Um, and it wasn't until like the mid aughts when I love the 80s and I love the 90s came out on VH1. And I felt like I got this crash course in 80s and 90s um, and 70s pop culture. Um, and it made it seem much more accessible. So reading this book did not feel like historic fiction because I felt like, oh, I understand like at least 60 to 70 percent of what is contextualizing this time. Um, and I'm really curious how like younger readers who also have access to this information in a much more like more deluge, I think, than us having like a one TV series dedicated to it, like how they feel about time in literature and where is their cutoff for what is historic. Um, because uh, to Emily's point, yeah, like American Girls, the dolls now has a 90s doll because that's seen as historic. But how do the actual people consuming American Girls or contemporary historic fiction understand that as a concrete point in time? Because like the 70s felt like a very long time ago in the 90s because we didn't have access to the culture. We didn't unless you had, like, had parents or family members who listened to the music. But that even is linked to older people. So you think of it as a aged piece of culture um and I, I feel like I'm talking around in circles but it is it brings up this um very like almost philosophical question of what is time and to whom and how do you delineate that yeah I did not think of this as historical fiction I mean I was born in the 80s but like uh, yeah no I I because I, again, that familiarity that you're talking about, Sheila, of like, eventually I consumed 80s movies and there were like TV shows and all of that, like going back to it. I recently noticed that a bunch of 80s movies have been added to different streaming services. And I'm just like, oh, I'm tempted to go back and watch these um, to see how well they stand up. <laughs> as well I pitched as it to my friends as historical fiction. But again, I wasn't alive. So maybe that's <laughs> why it felt historical. <laughs> to me fascinating I love it I feel like too looking at like if teenagers today if they were born like in the mid-2000s like I have teenage and these small relations who are like almost 15 almost 17 almost 19 and I have a bunch of like cousins kids are around the same age so 
I feel like the stuff they know from the 80s is things that, you know, cool aunties or their parents are like forcing on them like, hey, this is so-and-so, this is so-and-so. And they've seen these movies. They've heard some of the references, not as in-depth as this book goes into some of the references, but you might be able to say, hey, Emilio Estevez, he was stupid and the outsiders because they've read that book. They've seen that movie. So they're small pieces. So I think as a teen who was born like in the mid, like, you know, the early 2000s, 90s wouldn't so much be historical, but I, I feel like 80s would because it was before their time. And it's something that their old parents or older people in their lives are putting on them as something that happened to them when they were younger. That's sort of my idea on the historical aspect of it. From like comparing it to like the conversations I've had with some of my teenage relations. I will say that the vibes are less tangible in like rewatching TV shows and dramas than it is to read it. Like to read about the lack of like a phone being available everywhere that you have to check your messages or you, three week, whatever the case is like those little details is what gets me with my feels with all the nostalgia because I'm like, yes, I remember this because I did not grow up. I mean, I grew up with the internet, but not this internet, you know, it's just, it wasn't nearly as influential and all consuming and omnipresent. Yeah. Cool. So we're reaching the top of the hour and I just wanted to see if there's any other thoughts or anything that you wanted to share about this book. I would just say thank you for picking it. I was so excited to see it on your list. Um, yeah. It's just really a great way to start off another year of discussions. So thank you. Say that for anybody who's, I don't know how you could still be on the fence after this conversation, but if you are, um, take a leap because it's a weird, fun book that reminds you how literature can be. It doesn't always have to be serious to make a point. Good point. Um, so next month we're reading After Parties um, and it's a set of short stories about Cambodian Americans in Central Valley, California. And so I just give me a second to look up the author. The author is Anthony Besnaso. It is a fantastic read. Um, I've just finished re reading it, but by an audio book um, and it just holds up so well. So we're really excited to talk to you all next month about it. Um, until then, everyone stay warm, stay safe, and hopefully your power doesn't go out. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.